Hello and welcome to the September 2018 Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club podcast. We are just back from a ex very exciting and productive conference of the National Association of EMS Educators, where some wonderful research was presented by a host of teacher researchers. Next, we'll be on to EMS World Expo in Nashville in October for the International Scientific Symposium, where we will host poster sessions and presentations from an international group of EMS researchers. So these are exciting times at the PCRF. We thank you for joining us today for this journal club. The Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. We believe it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to build a body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. Here with the PCRF Journal Club, we take a closer look at some of the latest research happening in EMS. I'm Megan Corey, and I'm joined by Dr. Tony Fernandez and Dr. Bill Toon. Unfortunately, we were unable to confirm an author to attend today. We apologize for that, but we'll plug away here without one and discuss any questions we might have for the researchers in this study as we go. The study we're going to be looking at today is entitled Plasma First Resuscitation to Treat Hemorrhagic Shock During Emergency Ground Transportation in an Urban Area. This is a randomized trial. This is a study funded by the U.S. Department of Defense and was recently published in the journal The Lancet. As usual, this review is paired with an article written by columnist Dr. Tony Fernandez in EMS World called The Trip Report, Turning Research into Practice. We encourage listeners to check out this article at emsworld.com under the category of education and training. And this is a very rich article um, this month because this study actually has a lot of research pearls in it that Dr. Fernandez uh, brings up in his trip report article. So really check that out. We'd also like to remind our listeners that the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum has formed a strategic partnership with the National Association of EMS Educators to promote research literacy and advance the science of EMS educational research. As part of this alliance, we'll be adding a new EMS Journal Club podcast focused specifically on educational research as part of our effort to promote evidence-based EMS education practices in our classrooms and our institutions. So these podcasts will be held on the fourth Fridays of the month. And remember, they're in addition to the current podcast. So we'll still be joining you on the second Monday for the Clinical and Operational EMS Research Podcast. But we're adding one, and that's the fourth Fridays of the month. So you can join us for our Educational Research Podcast later this month on September 28th, Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central Time. And we will be discussing then research on test-enhanced learning in Healthcare Professions Educations Program. Thank you all for joining us today. So let's begin with our article today. And we want to remind listeners that you can use the chat feature on your screen to type in questions and comments, and we will bring those into the conversation as we go. So plasma first resuscitation. Little background, one of the major causes of death, as we know, in uncontrolled hemorrhage is coagulopathy assumed to be attributed to depleted clotting factors and uncontrolled fibrinolysis. So treatment with plasma seemed to be a promising therapy. And in fact, preemptive plasma resuscitation following injury was thought to maybe lessen the likelihood of traumatic uh, induced coagulopathies, acidosis, hypothermia, I think uh, calling that the lethal triad, um, the paper references. And then when accompanying your standard shock treatment to like, you know, keeping the patient warm, taking them rapid transport to a level one trauma center. In fact, military research from Iraq uh, in 2003 and 2005 reported increased survival with high ratios of plasma to red blood cells. But other studies, um, including randomized controlled trials had mixed results. So the FDA is, and then this was really key, um, they made a point to, to demonstrate that there's a timing issue here. The um, Food and Drug Administration is poised to approve lyophilized plasma. I don't know where they're at in that approval process, but I know um, that they were poised to approve this. And lyophilized plasma is a form of fresh frozen plasma that is uh, compatible with all blood types, can be stored at room temperature for about two years, and reconstitution takes less than six minutes. There's a number, if you look up uh, lyophilized plasma, there's a number of, you know, laboratory and efficacy and effectiveness studies. 
um, that are comparing, you know, fresh frozen plasma to lyophilized plasma in, uh, in terms of reconstitution and other factors. Uh, this paper mentions that the Department of Defense decided because of this um, this uh, FDA move to approve lyophilized plasma, uh, the Department of Defense funded two randomized controlled trials that are considered pragmatic trials. And we'll let uh, Dr. Fernandez comment on that in a little bit, what that means. But these controlled trials are, uh, the first one is this paper, the COMBAT trial, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the COMBAT trial is a short transport urban uh, out of the city of Denver, and COMBAT stands for Control of Major Bleeding After Trauma Trial. At some point, we'll talk about making catchy names for um, studies. And then the second um, the second trial is the PAMPER trial, which is the longer helicopter-based, longer transport helicopter-based trial, um, looking at the same thing, uh, which is the pre-hospital air medical plasma trial. That This paper actually mentions results from that uh, toward the end of the paper. But let's focus in on the combat trial, which is what this this research is about. Their research question was really, would plasma-first resuscitation affect trauma-induced coagulopathy and adverse outcomes after injury in patients with hemorrhagic shock? So their hypothesis was that mortality would be lower among patients who received plasma prior to arrival um, at a level one trauma center than those who received the standard of care. So um, to move into, that's your question, that's the research question, that's what they're thinking. So now how would you design a trial to answer that question? That's, that's usually how we take, um, walk through a, a research proposal would be, we have the background, we identify the gap or the area of, uh, that needs some, uh, the question addressed. We develop a question to address that gap. And now we say, what design of research could best address that question? So, um, Tony, could you get, walk through, you know, how you would how they designed this trial to to address that question? Yeah, absolutely. So they called this a pragmatic, randomized, placebo-controlled single center single central trial, and um, there's a lot to to uh, unpack there. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about what a pragmatic trial is. And the pragmatic trial is essentially um, a trial that's meant to um, evaluate the intervention, the effectiveness of the intervention in a real world scenario. So um, kind of with routine practice conditions. So this is not something that they're doing in a, in, in, in a sterilized lab. Um, they're not going to try and, um, and take any steps to, to change the pre-hospital environment uh, to better evaluate uh, the the intervention, they're going to evaluate the intervention in, in as it would be in a real world setting. And that's important because um, a lot of time, a lot of randomized trials will try and isolate anything uh, that would or could uh, impact the evaluation of the intervention. And obviously there's a lot that can happen in a pre-hospital environment that can um, skew how the intervention itself is working. So. Um, now there's there are different types of trials. This one um, is meant though to see uh, see if it'll really work in the field. Um, randomized randomization is, is important in any trial uh, because you're going to uh, th that's one of the ways you want to attempt to get rid of bias in your study. Um, if you if you didn't randomize uh, effectively and let's say um, one group um, or you you chose by choice to have one group be uh, all male um, or one group be um, all folks with some comorbidity, you wouldn't actually be fairly evaluating the trial. So you randomize uh, to try and weed some of that bias out. And they, the authors stated that they randomized uh, with a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so essentially what that means is they tried to have uh, equal groups or equal numbers of uh, subjects in each group, and one in the in the saline um, control group, and one in the um, the plasma group. They wanted those numbers to be the same, and you do that um, because it's, uh, it's statistically it's more the most efficient way to do that. Um, based on your sample size, you'd have a better chance of seeing if in, seeing a difference if one did exist. So that's that's a common way to 
to do random allocation. Um, there's other ways to do it. You can do two to one group or three to two group based on uh, the, the goals of your study, but um, they decided that a one to one random allocation was the best way to answer their, um, their, their hypothesis or address their hypothesis and answer their research question. You know, before you um, before you continue with that, you're talking about the, the pragmatic part of it. I think the most attractive thing about that is, and and let me know if I'm wrong here. They're trying to get at the clinical decision making that goes on, rather than saying uh, these are the, the the definitions of when you can do this under these you know multiple inclusion and exclusion criteria. Because we're instead of being interested in the actual not they're not interested in the pathophysiologic process, but instead of just looking at those those processes, they're looking at the, the clinical decision that leads a person to treat as well. I, I think that's what the the um, pragmatic is getting at. Uh, yeah, absolutely. A, yeah, so trying to, I think that's attractive because, you know, later um, at some point we're going to be going through the, these big airway trials. Um, you know, we, we were talking about this offline, but we'll be looking at some of these big splashy airway trials that have been out lately and and that's one of the critiques that i think i have uh, about it is are they getting at the real clinical decision that occurs but behind whether or not you select one versus the other so i, I think that was confusing at first to me when i was trying to imagine i'm on this ambulance in denver and they hand me a cooler and what and it's either going to have you know frozen plasma or it's going to have frozen water and I'm thinking well why, why even put the water I'm not giving the water to the patient if I see the water I'm giving them the saline but by opening the cooler I've essentially said I would choose this patient to give this treatment is that, yeah, that, that absolutely and also okay. um, you by doing some masking like that um, you try and remove some of the bias inherent in the in the rescuer um, if the if the paramedic didn't believe in an intervention um, and they didn't they, they you want that that decision to be made as late as possible so you want everything to look as, as the same and the authors actually mentioned that they they wanted to um, it, they had planned to infuse the same amount of saline um, uh, it was around 800 milliliters um, in patients because that is would be similar to what what they deliver in plasma, um, but they decided not to do. They wanted to do that to keep everything consistent, and again to try and blind the the paramedics for as long as possible. Um, but they 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 chose against that because it wasn't practical. Um, but again, there's you want to. It's it's a way to one. You want to you're evaluating your clinical decision making. Um, two, you're going to see if this if this intervention works in it, this this intervention may may be great in hospital it may be great in in other settings but it may not work pre-hospitally and by doing a pragmatic trial you really can uh, address that yeah that's great so uh so you were on the randomization scheme we've got um ab fresh frozen plasma which was the the site and and we were talking about this offline too i'm not sure i, I think i would have asked the authors too why um was lyophilized plasma more expensive? Was it was there a reason for, to not use that, or was AB um, fresh frozen plasma the same considered the same? Um, but that was the treatment group, and then standard of care. Yep, and they the standard of care was um, it was saline as as their uh, normal practice allowed um, the standard of care, uh, and they quote that that's their placebo um, for the placebo controlled part of that long sentence. The, uh, study type and and then single center this was done this was done in Denver Denver has a, a, a pretty high level uh, unique paramedic division and and um, one thing that's important to know about this system was their their relatively they have relatively short transport times to their trauma center um, which is something that the authors discuss and we'll discuss later when we get to kind of limitations and generalizability of these results Okay, and then um, if you could, before uh, we move uh, toward what they measured as their outcome, um, th this is not a blinded study, um, and right. for reasons we just talked about, they they use the frozen water to actually get it more the decision making to actually um, make the decision to treat, and then when they see oh that it's frozen water, um, they go to what their standard treatment would be, which would be regular saline. So, um, and then I I believe they. Do they go through the um, 
they, I, I, one thing I can't remember is if they had to defrost. I don't think they had to defrost um, the frozen water. No, like in, in, order, in order of time, because they're not using it. It's just again to they to show that they this is the treatment group now. They can look at it and they say, okay, it's not the the treatment group. I'm going to my standard therapy, and they go yep. to saline. Okay, that's exactly what they did. Yeah, they did not uh, defrost the water. And it's probably not an issue because uh, that that's it's that's where the decision is. If you do have, uh, I was part of a randomized. Um, a clinical trial that was blinded where we had uh, three drug groups and one of the drugs had was was uh, the vehicle that it was mixed in was propylene glycol which it which is viscous so you would be able to tell the difference so they study group had had them wrapped in this transparent yellow uh, wrapping so you and the the placebo was a propylene glycol and the other drug that was not um, mixed in propylene glycol. You couldn't tell because of this clear, you could still see the liquid, but you couldn't tell the viscosity. So that would be, um, you know, an alternative, you know, wrapping them in uh, different colors or, or whatever, uh, but all kinds of different things go into blinding. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the hardest uh, things to set up and do correctly when you're doing a, a blinded randomized trial. And then who was the study population? I think we didn't uh, mention the population. Oh, yeah. So these are patients. Um, these are, are trauma patients in Denver Health. Uh, um, so these are, these are patients that were deemed by the paramedic um, to be candidates for the study. Um, they, were, they were looking at patients who had, were in hemorrhagic shock, and their definition for hemorrhagic shock was uh, systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 70, or between 71 and 90, with a heart rate greater than 108. Um, so these that that was their their study population. So whether that that's that's where they started. If they found a patient who looked like this, um, then they're going to look to uh, either they're going to they're going to enter them into the study and and decide and open their cooler and see which group they went into. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't know that beforehand. Uh, and then the study had some some exclusion criteria that are important. Um, this was this was an adult study, so if they were less than 18, they were excluded. Um, there are specific IRB rules for uh, some uh, what they call um, vulnerable populations, and prisoners and pregnant women are 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 always included in that group. Um, so they excluded them from this population. That um, was likely. Uh, uh, required by the IRB or or they would have had to go through some extra hoops to get get approval um, they they excluded folks if they had an isolated gunshot wound to the head um, if they or if they had CPR performed um, before randomization um, or if they were in a systole or they had uh, CPR performed before randomization um, and then, uh, obviously, if they had some known objective to blood products, um, either identified by some kind of opt-out bracelet or necklace, um, which was interesting about this study is uh, they didn't have to get immediate um, uh, expressed uh, consent, uh, informed consent. They were able to um, have implied consent, and they could they would pull consent later on if they if the family member objected or or so on, and they they'd remove them from some of the analyses. Um, and I and, wonder how they trained the paramedics on that. Um, again, the trial that I was uh, a study coordinator on was they were talking back, you know, in the late '90s. This was right around the time that. Uh, there was uh, something called a waiver of informed consent at that time. It was not mm -hmm. called an exemption. That was actually coming into play. And right in the middle of the study, they had instituted the um, rules about uh, public disclosure and community uh, meetings and, and having to disclose in newspapers or, or targeted populations. Uh, and, and the use of opt-out bracelets came after that. So uh, that was something that, that was coming out right around that time. So the opt-out bracelets and necklaces, usually, I mean, it, this is a hard one to target because it, it's, you know, these are, quote, accidents, right? So this is not, there, is there a target population? If you have a population that's more likely to have a stroke or more likely to have, you know, a, a clinical condition, you can isolate them um, through, you know, certain clinics or physicians or whatever, you can target them uh, through education, say, by the way, there's going to be this clinical trial. If you want to opt out, um, contact the study coordinator and, and you can have a bracelet. 
or if you'd like more information or and then have community meetings for this um, it's hard to target a population you know it's hard to find who are going to be the the folks so finding an opt-out um, a bracelet on someone would be um, I, I, the odds <laughs> would be pretty incredible uh, in a sure. in a trauma sure. study Absolutely, and there weren't many. Um, uh, there, there were some in each group who are listed as no consent. The authors didn't go um, into detail uh, about what that no consent meant for each group, um, but I'd anticipate they were, that uh, there was only seven. So uh, in yeah. one group and uh, the other group, I think had eleven. Um, oh no, seven yeah. and two. Yeah. So it's. Um, it's it's likely that that not a lot of people did um, opt out initially, uh, yeah. and maybe some new members did. Yeah, yeah, and the then authors the did training. That, you know, the authors definitely did state though that they had community consultation and public disclosures, yes. as would yeah. as is required for all these studies. But that's right. again, finding it that, that's a hard message to get out. Yeah, it is. And then the, when someone objects to the study, does that mean the paramedics were advised to? say something about the study or did they just kind of see what was going on and say wait a second here is this a study you know I don't want to be I don't want them to be part of it or you know it's it's hard to to know what what that was you know what which uh, that would be something I would ask uh, the, the study coordinators was this something yeah. that the, the paramedics have to inform people on the scene as they were working on this I mean it's really really tough you're on a critical patient and you've got to take a moment to say oh by the way um, and, and yet, we know that these studies are really important because, the, and that's why the approval layers are so dense and and um, or, oriented toward patient safety. Because without it, we don't know if we're not treating patients appropriately, and if the standard of care is in fact, you know, inferior. So I think it's hard to get that point across sometimes to people because, you know, it, of course, everything is still fresh from. Uh, Nuremberg and Tuskegee and and all of these other things that that have come to light over the many years of of unethical research. So <laughs> I think some of that still mm -hmm. hovers over people's heads. Uh, not to mention all the Hollywood movies with the you know evil scientists. Uh, we do have a, a comment from Chris too about what we're talking about, and this is that he says this is a very eloquent method of obtaining a sample population, as it allows for, in essence, a double-blind study right up to the point of administration, while also allowing for the blood bank to continue to track and control how plasma is leaving the bank. Um, and an interesting point with the frozen water, their resuscitation patients um, three minutes faster with saline versus the plasma group, since it just took under three minutes to defrost the plasma. So a couple of good points um, from Chris uh, there. Uh, let's um, so we've got the the population and the procedure, the methods. Um, now what what are they going to look at? What's their outcome? So their outcome was mortality within 28 days. Um, they had a few <clears throat> excuse me. They had a few um, uh, uh, secondary outcomes that they looked at, but overall, um, uh, the what they were looking at, what they wanted to. And what they thought they'd improve with plasma was mortality within 28 days. And then we had some secondary outcomes of uh, multiple organ failure um, or presumed uh, by a number of different indicators. And then indicators of trauma-induced coagulopathy. I mean, it was kind of eloquent. They, they, when you arrived on the scene and when you treated the patient, you also took a blood sample immediately and that blood sample was utilized for, you know, before and, you know, serial um, measurements into in the hospital. Uh, indicators of trauma-induced coagulopathy we mentioned. Um, and then they mentioned exploratory outcomes. So these would be more like tertiary outcomes, some other things that they'd like to, they wanted to look at that would matter in, in the, uh, and may, maybe make a difference uh, in the mortality of the patient. Time from injury to the need for the first red blood cell transfusion, ventilator-free days, ICU-free days. So kind of quality uh, outcome measures and then any presence of multiple organ uh, failure at all whether it was within the 28 days or not uh, and then also safety outcomes there's always um, kind of safety outcomes as well transfusion related lung injury or acute lung injury that are assumed to be part of the the treatment um, we also were talking about early stopping rules so one of the things that you see up on your screen right now those of you who have a computer and you're looking at the slide is the breakdown of the 
um, the patients, the eligible patients and into the groups. And you see ITT, intention to treat. So I'm gonna ask Tony if you can walk us through this chart uh, on the uh, table, um, oh, which table is it? It's the randomization uh, scheme. It is the trial profile. It doesn't have a table number. Just this figure, it's a figure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was interesting. So the 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 study they as as with both studies and and certainly all randomized uh control trials they'll, they'll do what's called a um a sample sample size calculation um and essentially what that's the the purpose of that is to determine how big each group has to be uh to to see if to find a difference if one does exist between your treatment group and your control group um, so they did a sample size calculation and they they came up with 150 patients that they would need um, equally distributed between each group. Uh, now you'll um, notice that uh, we're talking about here in this table 144 patients um, and we'll uh, we'll get get to that in a second why they that number is different from what they had originally found in their sample size calculation. Um, but then you as you follow the table down, uh, you follow the tree down, you'll see there are 75 patients assigned to the plasma first group, um, 69 patients assigned to the saline control group. And then you'll see some patients who met the exclusion criteria that we talked about a little earlier. Um, and then as you go down, they say 75 patients, all 75 were included in the intent to treat analysis, 69 patients were included uh, in the intent to treat analysis for the other group. But then there's uh, this row below that that says 65 patients were included in the as treated analysis and 60 patients were included in the as treated analysis for the saline group. Um, so it's uh, there, the difference in, the, in these analyses has more to do with uh, uh, statistical analyses than um, what folks might uh, might understand or, or think is 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 easy and and, and the way to go. Um, so. Let's talk about the as-treated analysis first. As-treated uh, is going to run the analysis, the statistical analysis, based on what you actually receive. So did you receive plasma or did you receive um, uh, saline? And, they, and they're not going to, um, they're, go, they're gonna take out people who were supposed to be taken out based on the exclusion criteria. Um, and if for some reason you received the wrong intervention, um, you would not be calculated in, the, in how you were initially assigned. If you were in the plasma group and you for some reason got saline, um, you would be counted in the saline group and not in the plasma group. Um, and in fact, there were actually two patients uh, who were supposed to get plasma, um, but uh, because the the paramedics, it appears that they they didn't recognize the the plasma and and proceeded with saline. Um, they actually got saline rather than plasma, and they were included in in the saline group for the as treated analysis because as treated is going to assess a, a, what happened, um, so to speak. Intent to treat is a little bit different, and what intent to treat does is they run the analysis based on how you were initially assigned during randomization. Now, one may question why you want why you would want to do that, um, and it typically you would do that for for trials that have a longer follow up period, um, because you can experience a lot of things that go wrong after randomization. There could be breaks in protocol. Um, there could be uh, folks who were non compliant if there was a medication that you were supposed to take every day over a certain period of time. Uh, there could be missing data. So, and a lot of those can't be accounted for. You can't, in some randomized trials, you can't actually do an as treated analysis because there's just no way for you to know if everything, um, if the patient received all the intervention that they were supposed to or didn't receive any in the control group. Um, so you would you would do that analysis on intent to treat and you get to forget about all the things that could go wrong afterwards. Um, but these these the as treat analysis is certainly more relevant for this study. Um, and while they were sort of checking a box, a randomized con controlled trial box with the intent to treat analysis, uh, the as treated obviously would be would be certainly more relevant. Okay, so. Um we also, you know, had a comment from, I think it was Lisa. Yeah, Lisa had said uh, regarding this consent, uh, bringing up, of course, religious reasons, that would be the objection for blood, blood products, I would imagine, just some ideas. And then um, standard 
a treatment for uh, saline bolus for medics. What was it? Um, and you know, I'm, I'm assuming they were going by you know pHTLS, and we'll find out later when we get to the results. You'll see that it was it was only about 250 milliliters, I think, and was the median or, or mean. And then any concern of hypothermia with the plasma administration, that was something I was thinking about as well when I was um, kind of looking at this. But the, some of these indicators are going to help us with that when we get to uh, the results. So and uh, you know these that's kind of one of the other questions that has come in is um, did the authors demonstrate that the two groups have the same or similar severity of trauma and that comes in in the comparison of the of the baseline characteristics uh, of the groups and actually uh, Jennifer will be bringing up that uh, slide next uh, if we can go through that's one of the first things you do when you've uh, after you've kind of described your groups you've randomized them into these and you look at your um, you know the the two different groups now you want to know do they uh, do they look the same? Uh, you know, are they? What are the baseline characteristics of the the group? And actually, I think this is uh, maybe you don't, we don't have the baseline characteristics table in here. This is actually results. So, but the baseline characteristics table is table one on page 287. If anyone has the article in front of them, it describes the demographics and clinical characteristics. Um, so, Tony, what you know, why what would be the things and and out there, if you're thinking about okay, we're we're looking at plasma versus um, standard of care, and we're looking at the effect on mortality and other things. What baseline characteristics would we as researchers select to look at between two groups? Well, you'd certainly want to look at your um, how injured the patients were, um, and make sure your groups are are similar in both um, the intervention and in the control group. And they did. Um, they used the uh, uh, the new injury severity score um, to to compare groups, and um, they also used uh, the abbreviated injury scale, a maximum score. So, and when you looked at the two groups, they had uh, both of them for the new injury severity score had a 27 and their confidence intervals were um, were similar. Um, they also looked at the percentage of, of patients in each group who had a score that was greater than 25, and uh, that was uh, 34, 33 in the plasma group and 34 in the control group. Um, and then in, they were similar in most of the, um, the maximum scores for the abbreviated injury scale. Uh, they also looked at at other things that, that would certainly be um, important, comorbidities, uh, those were similar. It was 15 percent in the that had comorbidities in the plasma group and 13 percent who had it in the control group. Um, they And you'd want to look at your typical demographics, age, um, uh, sex, and uh, they also looked at body mass index. All of those were similar in both um, the, the study group and the control group. Um, so they they did a good job of uh, afterwards after randomization just just making sure that each group was uh, was similar. Yeah, and I think it's really important for people that are out there reading research too to understand these are not just sort of and I think we mentioned this in previous podcasts. This, these are not just random. Well, you know we have to measure demographics and we and we should measure these things. The reason we we look at these categories is we assume that they will confound results, right? We we think that Absolutely. well this they may be associated with a poorer outcome or a better outcome. So we want to look at anything that we think might be associated with an improved or a worsening outcome that could explain the results independent of what we're studying. And so you just kind of take a look in either side and say, all right, do they look about equal here? Well, then we can account for, well, we, we've taken account of that. Um, I think Bill Toon is on. Um, Dr. Toon, would you have any uh, comments or uh, issues when you look at the baseline characteristics and the comparison of the two, the plasma group, the control group, uh, before we hit the outcomes. Oh, sure. Box me into uh, a specific thing. <laughs> well, you, got such a, you have such a specific eye for detail, so. I, you know, I, I did look at it as, as well as uh, you did, and again, I'm sure you mentioned this already. If you have not actually gone out and picked up this article and read it yourself that's the most one of the most critical things i always like to remind people it's so important mm -hmm. to actually read it yourself and formulate your own opinion but i do think the two groups look very similar and i think that gets what you've discussed already is the pragmatic nature of this is the fact that they um <clears throat> were looking at hey this would be someone i would treat 
and I would want to treat with plasma. And I think that that helped make the groups look pretty close to each other. Now, Tony will tell me if I'm right or wrong. No, I completely agree. I think that um, the, the they looked for similar pay. The definition, right, of, is is probably one of the most important factors here. You want to you 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 come up with your definition of your study population early, and they have a good definition, um, one that's clinically relevant and um, that that is something that the paramedics can identify in the field. Um, and that having a good definition and a a well thought out randomization scheme. Um, those those two things should lead to equal equal um, groups that look similar, um, and and they succeeded here. Yep, and get involved in this stuff. Uh, if there's a local uh, research group or if there's research trials going on in your area, get involved, and uh, because you know researchers don't always work in the field, and they may there may be factors that are associated with outcome that that you'd like to see considered um, extrication times and place and other things that are unique to the field that, that someone may not be considering. So it's really helpful to have somebody that's part of the team that, that knows what, what's going on in the field. Uh, so that can be added to the comparison between the control and the treatment group as well. So let's take a look then over this three-year period, uh, 2014 to 2017, um, at the results. And we've got the first table up here, uh, which is the outcomes. Um, and do you want to walk us through the, the outcomes? This is the first part of the table. It's actually a huge table, and the first part of it here is clinical and physiologic and shock outcomes. Um, second part, I think, is coagulation and transfusion of fluids after injury. Yeah, so this is, um, I think first, let, let, let's, let's talk about, as, the table, as we see on the table, their, their initial outcome of interest, which is mortality at 28 days. Um, and you'll see that uh, the percentage who who died within 28 days are similar. Um, the odd, the I'm sorry, this is a risk ratio. Um, the risk ratio that those confidence intervals, 60 to 3.98, um, the an odd a risk ratio of one would mean that there's no difference. Um, and typically, if you'll see, if well, if you see a confidence interval where the number one is somewhere within, within that confidence interval, uh, that's not a statistically significant result. And you'll see that they're from 0.6 uh, all the way up to 3.9. So that confidence interval would contain one. Um, and, and all that with the p-value of 0.3, um, uh, 0.37, you'll see that uh, typically a p-value of 0.05 um, is what you would use to identify statistical significance. Um, so you'll see with their main outcome, as well as with all these secondary outcomes that they look at, there's no p-values that are point, um, 0.05 or less, and there's no confidence intervals that do not contain one. Uh, that's important because that tells you that their results, there's no difference. They're they not seeing any statistically significant difference, um, and with the results they have, they're not seeing any really clinical or practically important differences between the groups. Now, this will lead us back to why why are they presenting results on just 144 patients um, if their initial sample size calculation told them they needed 150. And to understand that, uh, well, we need to talk about a little bit how uh, randomized controlled trials are monitored, because oftentimes you're using an intervention that is not um, that is not within the standard of practice. Um, you're going to your your controlled trials are going to be reviewed um, by by Two, um, two authorities, and one specifically here is the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Group. And what they do is they'll analyze the data at certain intervals. Typically what you do in, in most research studies is you, you would collect all of your data, and once you've, you've reached your, your, the number that your sample size calculation told you was important, you would run the analysis on both groups. Um, what they did here, because this is a trial, um, is they were looking in sporadically um, at, at predefined intervals. They were looking at the results to see if there was anything different. Um, and you can have trials stopped either because the trial, um, the the intervention is harming patients. Um, uh, years and years ago, um, a they they stopped a um, mechanical compressions trial um, because they found that it was it was harmful to patients. Um, you can stop a trial because the intervention is too good. Um, it's worked so well that it would be um, you would be depriving patients if you were not giving them um, 
this new intervention or this new drug. Um, or they can stop it because there's just no difference. And, and they, even if they reach, even doesn't matter how much more data you collect, um, seeing a difference is not very likely. They call it futile, um, kind of like doing CPR on someone who's decapitated. Um, so, and that's what happened in this study. They, they, they've got to a point, they got to 104 patients and the board said, um, you're not gonna see a difference. Uh, there's no need to continue with this trial. Um, and as you'll see with all these outcomes, uh, there there are no statistically significant differences. Yeah, and that's I, I think um, Bill brought it up earlier too when we were talking offline about the the idea of stopping rules. And I've always struggled this, with this myself. And that is, well, if you've established a power calculation, you say you need a certain amount in order to reach statistical significance, and then you stop early, um, then then it's you know. Wait a second. We stopped early, so how do we how do we know? But the way you described it, I think, was um, very elegant. I mean, I think on page 280, 289, those of you who are looking up this article, if you look at page 289, there's a a nice description of their stopping rules. Um, you know, they had what's called a data safety monitoring board, um, which is actually different than the institutional review board. It's separate and independent from institutional review boards. Sometimes your IRBs can be at an, a single institution, which it probably sounded like it was here because it was a single level one trauma center. Uh, sometimes if you have um, you know, multiple institutions that you're transporting patients to, you have to have approval of multiple IRBs. Um, so that's that's different. You have the mm -hmm. IRB that's reviewing the ethics of the study and, and, um, and reviewing uh, you know, progress reports and, and other things. And they have a specific membership that's established and, you know, uh, requirements for each of the members. And then you have the Food and Drug Administration. And this was under something called the Investigational New, well, it's not drug, or well, I guess it is, investigation. it would be an Investigational New Drug, not a device, but an IND, um, which has also its own uh, federal regulations uh, under the uh, FDA regulations. But also if you, uh, look up research that, and government funded research in particular will have this, but also privately funded research will require that something that has, um, you know, that's like this, a randomized, you know, quote, placebo controlled uh, trial will have something that had, where you need a data, data safety monitoring board. And that board specifically gets to watch the results as they move along in real time. And they establish stopping rules that if you're starting, if they're starting to see either a, a major safety issue or they're starting to see that you're headed toward um, something that, you know, by the end, you're definitely not going to see a statistically significant difference either way, then they'll stop uh, the study. So I think um, that's an important concept. And they walk through, I think, the different steps, the first analysis, the second analysis, the third analysis, and what they were looking at um, in terms of deaths, um, it, which was their primary outcome and the relationship between them. So you could literally plot that on a, on a, a chart over time. So um, Jennifer, can you advance? So you're seeing clinical outcomes here and then all of these secondary outcomes. Somebody mentioned in one of the uh, questions online, um, the hypothermia, I brought it up a little bit earlier, were they concerned about hypothermia and administering the uh, plasma? And I think instead of measuring core temperature, what they did was measure what the results of, of hypothermia might be. On, you know, and so there's all of these factors, these coagulopathy factors that come up here. We see the physiologic measures here, plasma versus control, and again, no difference. And I think there's another slide here uh, in this set that continues with this, and there's an entire table of uh, coagulation on arrival at the hospital um, that shows, you know, no significant difference either in any of these. Did did anything approach significance? Do you think, or any of these flag you? Yeah, here they are, the INRs and um, all these different values that I'm not familiar with um, that have to do with uh, a thromboelastography a word I had not been familiar with, and fibrinogen, all of these factors, all the coagulation factors. So there, there, there were some things that approached significant, or that were um, in the secondary outcomes that were that were significant. Um, uh, you'll see, uh, the, if you look at the, the p-values all the way on the right-hand side here, you're looking for anything that's 0.05 uh, or below, um, and you'll see that um, 
time from injury to first red blood cells, that was significant. Um, time from emergency admissions to first red blood cell uh, at the unit, that was also significant. And um, uh, and this is this is somewhat intuitive. The last one, uh, the the volume of normal saline used in the field, um, that was also a significant difference. Um, but you probably anticipate, you should anticipate that or expect that because the, the, the control group was by default given saline in the field. The plasma group was, was going to receive saline. I'm sorry, was going to receive plasma first. Um, so you would expect that group to, ha to have um, less milliliters of saline delivered. And probably the same with the INR. And there was one other uh, factor, but it was close, but not quite, 0.06. Yep. Uh, and then we have, is there one more table there, um, Jennifer, to put up? I think that was a continuation, and that was what Tony was showing, was the uh, the uh, transfusion or fluids after injury. There might be one more there. Yeah, that, this is what you were mentioning. So again, all the way over on the right, we see the two, time from injury to first red blood cell unit, time from emergency admission to first red blood cell unit. Um, and that's, you know, the, for the reasons you outlined, it makes sense. So a lot of detail in these results, a lot of these secondary uh, results. And if you look up the, you know, like I said, if you just type in or just Google lyophilized plasma, you'll get um, quite a few, uh, you know, you'll see the reasons why some of these were chosen because some of these are used in other um, other effectiveness studies if, from the lab and, and using, um, you know, research in the lab all the way into, you know, the clinical setting where they're just looking at the feasibility and, and effectiveness and the impact on blood values. And that's, you know, pretty much it, not the, uh, and physiologic values, not overall outcomes, and certainly not use in the practical setting like we see in this trial. So any other comments do you have uh, on these tables, Bill? You're just whistling there. <laughs> Is that me there? That's you. <laughs> oh, I thought I had muted myself again. Uh, nope, no comment. So much for thinking the mute's on. You know, that's like when you take your wireless mic still on and you go into the bathroom <laughs> during a conference. Not a good thing. Yeah, that, that's okay. That, nothing beats when I leaned on my mute key and Dave Page had just made a really big announcement or a big statement and expected this big splash and there was complete silence <laughs> and I was like oh I mute button I just leaned on it <laughs> and I think he thought he offended which is hard to do uh, let's see we've got a question from Lisa um, yeah the age is actually where I think Lisa didn't have the article right in front of her and that's okay and uh, I know if you guys could sometimes these articles um, maybe it isn't available or um, and again if you can read the accompanying trip report uh, that actually helps to uh, get some ideas of what we're what to glean out of this especially an article like this that has lots of tables and lots of numbers and you know you, you don't have Dr. Fernandez to call and say, what does this mean? You can read his uh, trip report. Was, this is a really good one. It has a lot of um, great uh, research pearls in it to, to learn from. Uh, but the ages, the um, age breakdown in the baseline characteristics, uh, yeah, they were similar, 33 years old in the plasma group, uh, 32 and a half in the control group. And again, the ranges were were very similar as well. So they looked uh, quite a bit alike. Now, the, the other thing to notice is, uh, and, and you mentioned that you're, uh, Lisa mentioned she's uh, working in the um, level two peds trauma center. And I'm noticing in this, that this is a, there's no pediatric patients. Now, I know that automatically you don't exclude, they're, they're not considered, a, they are considered a vulnerable population, but not in every study. I've seen when we reviewed the Rampart trial many years ago, uh, which was a, a status epilepticus study, multi-center um, trial, and pediatrics were included in that trial as well as adults. So, um, you, you know, any reason you think pediatrics would not be appropriate in this study? Um, I think it's, uh... So typically what you'd see is you're going to focus on one population, um, probably because they had to, 
uh, they, they ha they'd have to take peds out and analyze them separately anyway. Um, so a I lot imagine of imagine the numbers would be small in a hemorrhagic yeah. shock population too. I guess absolutely. So you, 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 they probably just wanted to focus on, um, on on numbers that they were sure they can get. And you'll see mm -hmm. if uh, in that first um, decision tree that we brought up, there were actually a couple patients excluded from the as treated analysis because they were less than eighteen. Um, so, but throughout the trial, they they excluded two in each group. So that 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 kind of goes back to your um, to the numbers uh, thing. Yeah. Um, now, before we kind of close out on this study too, let's talk about limitations because every study has limitations. And in the, I think they do a good job in their discussion talking about their findings and um, you know the importance of the findings, but. They also mention, as you always do, the limitations. And one of them sort of stood out to me. Uh, they mentioned that their inclusion criteria was based on um, historical trends and the ROC trials, the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium trials of traumatic hypovolemic shock. And they mentioned that some of the hypotension seen before arrival at the hospital might not have been due to hemorrhage, which um, I thought was an, an interesting thing. I'm. Uh, I don't necessarily know that that's a limitation because that wasn't really the question. The question was, did they, it's still the decision is being made by someone who thinks it's hemorrhage. So, and that's, it's a pragmatic trial. That's really what you're getting at is in the patients where it is thought to be a traumatic hemorrhagic shock, this is how we're treating them. So I thought that was, um, so I thought it was interesting. They raised that as a, a limitation. I would see that more as a limitation if it wasn't pragmatic, if you were trying to explain, you know, the, the association between plasma and recovery um, or mortality. Uh, the other thing uh, they say is the challenge is going to be improving identification of the target population without burdening emergency care personnel or increasing transport times. But then they noticed that it really didn't increase transport times at all. Um, plasma doesn't improve outcomes when given 30 minutes during the rapid ground transportation to a quote mature level one, never heard mature, level one trauma center. So, um, and they, they mentioned it really didn't um, drastically improve uh, your, the treatment and transport times uh, or increase the, the length of time that they were spent on carrying out the study. So I think um, one of the things that, uh, that this brought to light to me was when we talk about and I hear this all of the time, when you talk about short transport times, what that actually means. Um, because we hear people say things all of the time in these, in these, uh, in the urban setting. You know, it's only two minutes to a hospital. It's only three or four minutes to a hospital. And th that's really not the case. I mean, I, I don't know if people are using that as just a, a, a you know, passing off, just kind of a, um, you know, they're not being, they're using it as an example or, or some kind of uh, metaphor or whatever, but um, it's it's not two minutes, it's not three minutes, <laughs> it's a longer period of time than that, um, and so so that's that has to factor in when we think of critical patients, um, and that this didn't really increase the the time on scene uh, or the transport time, but the transport time, and I'm looking for it in here what the actual uh, numbers were, um, but it's longer than than what. Uh, you know, people are saying uh, when they kind of talk about urban systems. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I want to just add my, so my experience is dated. There's no question about it. But when I worked in a large urban system, we really did have a mindset, at least with penetrating trauma. Um, if they were out in the street, they were in the back of the unit and you were heading to the hospital with stuff yep. getting what you could get done on the way. And I mean, it could be if I if I got there in some cases and the person was still standing, I had him step into the back of the unit or onto the cot and I tell my partner to go. And yeah. so we could have, you know, very short scene and short transport times in, in that kind of environment. So it, it can exist, but that's probably not generalizable again across the entire population, which is where which is what we're interested in is how well does this work consistently everywhere? So. Um, so that, but I do think it's important for them to recognize that within their system that that could be a factor here. Yeah, yeah and, and I think, also, oops, sorry, sorry, go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say that I think that they 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 really wanted to be careful, um, and you can see this throughout their discussion to say that 
while this study didn't find uh, any important differences, um, there they were looking at that uh, a study that one the trauma center was going to uh, deliver plasma anyway, um, and two they had what they called relatively short transport times. Um, and they didn't find any negative uh, effects of, of delivering plasma. So they were really careful to say that the, the, their population could be significantly different from another population that would that could study the same thing, particularly with longer transport times or in some kind of wilderness environment, um, or if you're in an environment that the trauma center or, or is 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 too far or the, or they won't deliver plasma, um, the results could could certainly be different. There was yeah, we exactly. saw something similar to with um, uh, hypothermia a few years ago, where um, a few papers came out very very similar times that suggested that um, while hypothermia does show improved uh, results, it may be the timing and maybe we don't need it as quickly. Um, and that's kind of uh, I think one of the take home points from this study. Yeah, and I think again, pragmatic is is the way to go when it comes to something like that because you're actually seeing things in the setting, you're capturing the clinical decision making, and you're realizing uh, the one the one thing I think that annoys me, and I think this is why it annoys me about the the whole discussion of transport time is what you're talking about, Bill, is what people are thinking of um, when someone can go you know, into the ambulance and drive to the hospital. But what we're talking about is what, how long did it take from the time that you arrived at the hospital until they are actually receiving the treatment. And it, there's all these other times in there that, that need to be factored in. And that's what's, what was, what's good about these pragmatic trials is you're capturing all of that. You're capturing, you know, every aspect of that. You're not just assuming that at the back of the ambulance is is the transport time and that's it there's all of these other things to factor in and they factor them in when you have a pragmatic study extrication i'm sure these were vehicle accidents largely um and that was something we, we mentioned too this was a, a blunt trauma pretty much all of it was blunt trauma um you know assumed because they mentioned vehicle accidents falls i can't remember what else but i think it was vehicle accidents and falls were the two biggies um and and so i'm assuming that the, these are are blunt uh, trauma. And, you know, we're talking about that, was well, there an extrication associated with that as well? So we're factoring that in and that comes into, that's again, what it, what's great about the pragmatic design is all of that is, is built in. Okay. Any final comments on this or did we, uh, I think we, we kind of covered everything on this. Um, we've got um, Chris, a, a couple of comments from, from our listeners. Um, Lisa said she would like to have seen age 15 and older to match the ACS definition of adult trauma patients. That's actually a good point. Again, that getting at that what's pediatric versus adult. I think there was uh, were a couple of protocol deviations, or uh, sometimes they're called protocol violations, where a patient was 17 uh, and that they can't be included uh, in that because of the definition. And then um, passing this, another comment from Chris, passing the study through an IRB to include kids without demonstrating a positive impact for adults first would be incredibly difficult at best. So, uh, and that may be the case. The, the other thing that may be the case is I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, pediatric trauma care. It may be that plasma, fresh frozen plasma, and maybe there's some difference in, in treatment um, in, in that population. So, uh, you know, again, we can, pull some pediatric folks or, or get an author on here to f figure that stuff out in the future. So, all right. So um, if, are there any other comments or questions? All right. No, thank just, you very uh, much. Whoa, mm -hmm. whoa, wait, you're so quick. I, I just like was going to say, again, I encourage, wait, you got to let me get the mute off because I was whistling the last <laughs> time. Um, I just want to encourage everyone, please try to find this article, read it yourself, formulate your opinion. And I also don't think this is the last that we're going to hear about uh, effective ways to uh, do it fluid resuscitation in the out of hospital environment. I still think there's a lot to be learned. And uh, I think we're, we'll see more work and most likely the military, thankfully, will be able to uh, do some of the funding behind this. But I don't think this is the end of the topic. Great. Thanks, Bill. Tony, any final comments? No, I, I'll just echo what Bill said. If you can, go go read this. This is a good one, and um, uh, I think it's a uh, it, it's it's a good addition to literature. So um, I'm glad that that, that it was funded and uh, it was completed.
Yes, and if you are someone who um, teaches EMTs and paramedics and you have a segment on research, this is an excellent article to pull. Don't let them be intimidated by the big tables and the p-values and the lots of numbers and the coagulopathy you know, discussion. It's got some real good uh, pearls. Pull up um, the EMS World article, The Trip Report uh, by Dr. Fernandez as an accompanying piece, and it's a just a, a great piece of um, literature to use in teaching about research. So thank you all for joining us. Please join us for next month. If you want to present an upcoming article, you can email David Page at dpage at emsed.net. That's dpage at emsed.net. We'll see you next month.